Let me start at the beginning there. There we go. Right. There we are at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the topic of hope is, is one that's been researched really very widely. Um, and you just can see just uh, some of the areas that have studied and uh, researched uh, into the, the, uh, the whole idea of hope. So uh, you'll find quite a few studies from psychology, sociology, economics, philosophy, medicine, political science, as well as uh, theology. So it's not just a topic that we are um, concerned about uh, pretty much across the board. Everybody's concerned about uh, um, the topic of hope. Now, the thing with uh, hope is, depending on how you would define it, I think all of us would define it with some kind of... Um, future orientation to it because that's what hope is about it's about thinking really about the future it's not so much about thinking about the past or even so much about where we are at the present but it is it orients us towards uh, moving towards the future and uh, the reason why that's significant is because the way in which people perceive the future really influences how we behave and how we experience the situation that we're in at the moment. So that's why um, hope becomes uh, such a significant uh, topic for us to, to look at. So in other words, hope is an in important determinant for mental health and well-being in general. Um, and these four topics that we're looking at over these four days are trying to address the whole idea of um, of well-being. So if we were to find some definitions for, um, um, for what hope is, the Oxford Dic Dictionary says, uh, hope is to want something to happen or to be true, and you usually have a good reason to think that it might. Um, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary says, hope is to cherish a desire with anticipation to want something to happen or be true. So it's something desired, something you want to happen. That, that's what hope is attached to. There are, of course, um, uh, some scientific definitions which by their nature are a little bit more complex. So um, one by Snyder, he says uh, that hope is the perceived capability to derive pathways to desired goals and to motivate oneself via agency thinking to use those pathways. I'm gonna unpack that in a little while, um, but that's just uh, one of the um, definitions of, of, um, of hope that's uh, pretty well known. <clears throat> Another one by Hearth, she says that hope is a multi-dimensional life force characterized by a confident yet uncertain expectation of achieving a future good, which to the hoping person is realistically possible and personally significant. We're gonna unpack that as well um, in just a while. Uh, when, you, when you do some reading around hope, you, you will notice that they try to um, um, distinguish between hope and optimism, um, saying that they're two very different things. So um, optimism is the tendency to expect positive things to happen. Um, and uh, here's three ways, ways in which hope and optimism differ. Hope is uncertain. You're not sure about the future that you're thinking about. So you're hoping it, it will happen, but you don't know if it's definitely going to happen. Optimism is just really sure. Yep, that's what the future will be. And you're, you're completely uh, sure that that, that is going to happen. So hope, uh, because uh, the, of the uncertainty that's involved, is more active in trying to make it happen. Whereas optimism, just don't need to do anything about it, it's gonna happen. <laughs> uh, that desired future will take place. Um, and so hope is much more of a process-oriented type of thing, whereas optimism, you just expect the goal to happen. Um, there's no thought about how it's gonna happen, etc. 
So it, that, that, that's one of the things that you'll notice when you're talking about hope, you're not talking about optimism. Optimism is just an expectation. Things are going to go well, end of story. Whereas hope has to work a little bit more uh, for, it to, for it to happen. Now, <clears throat> is it possible to measure hope? Um, I mentioned Schneider earlier, uh, Charles Schneider. He, uh, he's a, a psychologist, um, deals with what's known as positive psychology. Here was his definition again. Hope is the perceived capability to derive pathways to desired goals and to motivate oneself via agency thinking to use those pathways. Um, now, what, what he did um, in um, uh, coming up uh, with this kind of uh, definition was he, he made a, a questionnaire uh, with 12 questions. And uh, these were the eight areas that you were to use to answer the questions in the questionnaire. So uh, from one, definitely false, all the way to eight, definitely true. And uh, here are the 12 questions. Uh, and he's come up with what's known as the adult hope scale. So he interviewed university students, um, only used 12 questions and uh, got them to, uh, to answer them according to um, the uh, rubric that you see there with the eight different kinds of answers. And then you could add up and uh, find out how strong you are or how strong your hope is. Um, now, from this, he, he, he saw two kind of areas that, that uh, uh, are important. So uh, depending on how you answer number one, number four, number six, and number eight, this would point to, sorry, um, this would point to um, what's known as the pathway subscale. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a little while. And then uh, depending on how you answer two, nine, 10 and 12, this would uh, give you the agency subscale. So within his definition, there's pathways and there's agency. Th those are the two important things for him. And the other, the other questions were just kind of fillers uh, in, his, um, um, in his questionnaire. So uh, for him, pathways are important. So the, a pathway, pathway thinking, is the human ability to generate different pathways from the present to the desired future. In other words, you can think about, this is the goal I have, and um, I can figure out ways to get there, pathways. So it's, it's a very cognitive uh, approach, this. But then you also need, so you don't just need to try and figure out how to get there. You also need agency, and that's the level of intention, confidence, and the the ability to actually follow those different pathways to that desired future that you're, you're thinking of. Um, so you need both pathways and agency. Um, and uh, uh, based on that then, you can uh, move from having very low pathways and low agency to having very high agency and high pathways. So. Uh, low pathways and low agency, you are a, uh, what would be known as a low hoper, um, and uh, high agency and high pathways would be a high hoper. That's kind of where you want to be. But you can also have the others. So you can have uh, someone with low pathways. In other words, they can't really figure out how to get to a desired um, outcome, but they may be fairly well motivated. Um, so uh, for that, I would think uh, maybe, you remember the story when Jesus asked the disciples um, to give the 5,000 food to eat, and they're thinking, <laughs> what do you mean? How, how, how do you get there? <laughs> that's impossible. That, that's kind of, I mean, they, they had high agency. They, they, they were, you know, quite, quite active as people, but they had no clue. They, they couldn't imagine that future, how you could get to the place where you could feed 5,000, especially with five loaves and two fish. Uh, but then you also have, uh, it's possible to have high pathways and low agency. Maybe the, the, the man at the pool of Bethesda who'd been there 
you know, for 38 years. And Jesus comes along and says, would you like to get well? And he says, well, you know, I know how to. So, so the pathway was clear. I just need to get in the water, but I've got no way of doing it. His, his agency was low. So, so you can see how this could possibly play out. Um, so <clears throat> when it comes to well-being then in general, according to Schneider, the, this pursuit of your goals and the, the perception of um, making those goals is what will drive your emotions. So if you are successful in reaching your goals, whether or not they're impeded. So, you, you know, you can get obstacles in the way, which is OK, um, because you just come up with different pathways to, to, to get past the emotions, uh, to get past the obstacles. Um, so, but as long as you're successful in reaching your goals, that will generate positive emotions. If you're unsuccessful um, and you're blocked from, from getting to your goals, that produces negative emotions. That's how he sees hope um, affecting our well being. Now, there's other ways of measuring hope. Um, Kay Hirth, she's uh, uh, a doctor um, who researched um, nursing and uh, she's looked at uh, hope when it comes to dealing with uh, sickness. She did some research, uh, especially with uh, patients suffering from, uh, from cancer. And uh, uh, remember her, her definition was that hope is a multidimensional life force and is characterized by a confident yet uncertain expectation of achieving a future good, which to the hoping person is realistically possible and personally significant. Now I'd like you to uh, grab a piece of pen, uh, a piece of paper and a pen, or maybe you could just use your, your mobile if you've got a mobile or go out to the full screen here, because I want you to, to take this test really quickly. Uh, her test is a little bit simpler uh, than Schneider's. Um, because uh, you only have to answer for uh, one of four. So if you strongly disagree with the statement, you put one. Um, if you disagree, you put two. If you agree, put three. Strongly agree, put four, okay? So let's go through this. There's only 12 questions again. Uh, see, see how strong your hope is, okay? So uh, there are the four. First question, I have a positive outlook towards life. What would you put for that? Just jot that down quickly. Number two, I have short and or long range goals. And three, I feel all alone. Number four, I can see possibilities in the midst of difficulties. Five, I have a faith that gives me comfort. Six, I feel scared about my future. Seven, I can recall happy or joyful times. Eight, I have deep inner strength. Nine, I'm able to give and receive caring love. Ten, I have a sense of direction. Number eleven, I believe that each day has a potential. And finally, number twelve, I feel my life has value and worth. So now you can add up your scores. Um, just add up the numbers that you put in in there, and that will. So it would vary from twelve to forty-eight, and that will give you a, a little indication of how strong your hope is. You don't have to share that with with uh, with me at least, but uh, it gives you just a little indication of of where your hope is at this moment today. So. 
Uh, for her, uh, what she found from, from this is there are three kind of main areas. Um, there's the, what's known as uh, uh, temporality and future. So that's the perception that a positive or desired outcome is realistically pro probable in the near or distant future. So that's, that's, if you like, it's kind of like Snyder's pathway thing. Okay, it's possible to get there. Um, number two, there's what's known as positive readiness and expectancy. So that's a feeling of confidence with initiation of plans to affect the desired outcome. That again, I guess, would correspond to uh, Schneider's um, uh, agency uh, aspect. But what she does, she adds a third element to, to this, which I think is quite good. And that's interconnectedness with self and others. So that's where you recognize that you are interdependent, it brings in that social element, if you like, the, the relational element to life. Uh, so that there's, there's an interconnectedness between yourself and others, between yourself and what she calls spirit, which I think we as, as Adventists would kind of connect more with. <clears throat> and so uh, you can have a look at your scores there as well. And you'll find how strong you are in each of these three areas. So, uh, for for the uh, the first area, temporality and future, it's according to how you answered number one, number two, number six, and number eleven. So you can see how how strong um, you were in that area. Um, based on your answers to number four, seven, 10, and 12, that tells you how strong you are in the area of positive readiness and expectancy. So that agency type area. And then uh, three, five, eight, and nine talk about interconnectedness with yourself and with others. So, uh, for, uh, for Kay Hearth then, hope is important. Uh, as I said, she did her research into um, um, people with illnesses and uh, hope is really important when it comes to the recovery process from illness. Um, it helps in motivating people to pursue healthy behaviors, preventing illness from developing in the first place sometimes. Uh, it can help uh, improve the prognosis of life-threatening illnesses and even being found to block pain in patients with chronic illness by releasing endorphins. Th these are all things that have been researched. So, so that's why hope is so important within this medical uh, area as well. So if we comp compare these two, we've got Schneider, I would say he's more of a two-dimensional uh, way of approaching hope talking about pathways and agency, uh, whereas Hearth, I would say hers is much more three-dimensional. So you've got a, a cognitive element to it, you've got an emotional element to it, but you also have the relational, which is really very important. So on the whole then, hope and well-being, it's important because high hope persons always seem to, in whatever tests you look at, they seem to score higher uh, than their low hope counterparts in academics, um, pursuing academics. Athletics, it's been researched quite well there as well. Uh, physical health, of course, and psychological adjustment. Um, but what about the Bible? What does the Bible have to say about hope? Uh, the last uh, 10 minutes I've got here. Um, well, in the Bible, there are 15 different Hebrew and Aramaic words and five different Greek words for, <laughs> for hope uh, that's translated. So, um, you know, 130 times you'll find the word hope used in the King James Version, um, 140 times in the New uh, American Standard Bible, uh, 143 times in the New King James, um, 144 time, 145 times in the uh, Revised Standard Version, 146 times in the New Living Translation, and 167 times in the New International Version. So uh, if you want a hopeful Bible, go for the NIV. 
and I'm not going to get into that discussion anyway. <laughs> uh, so, but um, yeah, and, and I'm sure we all have our our um, uh, specific text text that we like when it comes to hope. This is one that's often used, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Um, Romans 15, very great blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, you've got uh, in Psalms, Israel, put your hope in the Lord. for The Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. Isaiah 40, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, soar on wings like eagles, they'll run and not grow weary, they'll walk and not be faint. Um, and we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, Hebrews 6. Let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, Hebrews 10. And of course, the great Adventist, blessed hope from Titus 2, 13, while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But let me uh, use one text then, just to make a couple of um, comments on how do we get hope? How does the Bible kind of help us to get hope? There's, uh, you all know the passage pretty well, I think, Ezekiel 37, the, the, uh, the vision of the, the dry bones. And, and as you may know, Ezekiel was... Um, he prophesied at the end of the, the, the kingdom of Judah, um, and uh, he was actually taken captive in, under the second um, uh, wave of, of uh, um, captivity for, from Babylon. And, uh, um, and so he gets this vision then in Ezekiel 37. The, the book is kind of divided into two parts, the first 33 chapters or so. Um, that's where God is giving uh, warnings to Jerusalem um, uh, and to the surrounding nations that uh, doom is coming. But then the, the last 15 chapters are messages to inspire hope. So this, this comes in that last part where it's a message of hope. And so let's read then Ezekiel 37. Uh, verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Now, we know that, you know, when they fought their battles, the, the army that won would take their, the, the ones from their side that had died, and they would bury them. But the, the losing side, their, their soldiers would just be left there to rot, basically. Um, it's a way of humiliating your enemy. Um, and uh, here he sees this valley full of dead bones. Obviously, there'd been a war and um, lots of dead bones there, but they were very dry. So they'd been dead for a good while. Um, and he had to go there and take a good look. What's the point of this? Well, we're told in verse 11, uh, God says to him, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we are cut off. So this is a, it's a, it's an illustration of what it's like when you have no hope left. It's like a valley full of dried bones. And that's really kind of what happens, isn't it? When, when things die, that's how you get bones. Something dies first. A relationship dies, and all we're left with are the dry bones of, of hurt and bitterness. Um, uh, you know, that picture of perfect health dies and all we're left with is are the dry bones of despair and hopelessness. If our trust in God dies, um, all we're left with are the dry bones of cynicism and, and doubt. So, so this is what you have portrayed here. The people are thinking, we've gone into captivity, there's no hope left for us. And so we told then in uh, verse 3, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? God, I think God's really quite interesting. You know, he, he asks some, some, uh, some pretty provocative questions sometimes. I mean, if you were sat there in a, in a valley full of dry bones, 
would you say, oh, of course I could move. Or, uh, I, I understand Ezekiel, uh, his answer, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Um, he's, you know, he's like a, uh, a politician, um, not saying yes or no, um, because, well, yeah, it's difficult to know, isn't it? I mean, God does ask some pretty tough questions sometimes. You see him asking, Abraham, can your 90-year-old wife become pregnant? <laughs> um, Jesus asked the disciples, can, can you feed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish? Or Mary Martha, can your brother who's been dead for four days live again? It's almost like God is trying to say, can you see, can you imagine a future past what you're seeing at the moment? Because it's so easy. We, we get stuck in that place where we... We believe, or we should believe, that God can provide manna in the desert. But when we see the letter that's telling us we're going to be evicted or that we've lost our jobs, what do you do then? Where, where's our hope? We believe that God can resurrect Lazarus, yes. But then when you see the casket of a loved one going into the ground, what, what happens to our hope then? We believe that God can heal the sick, but when you... You go to the doctor and you see the x-rays or, or, or whatever else it might be. And you, what happens to our hope then? Um, and so he carries on. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I'll make breath enter you and you'll come to life. I'll attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Um, and so he prophesied. He started preaching to these dry bones. I mean, that, that's quite a, you know, I could go off on that one. <laughs> that's quite a congregation <laughs> to preach to, right? <laughs> uh, a really dead congregation, literally. Um, uh, I always remember, and I know there are some Norwegians here. First time I came to Norway and I, and I preached. I mean, that for me was a dead congregation. There was, no, there was nothing. Um, I was used to at least hearing some sounds from people in the congregations in England, but over and over, not a sound. Of course, they weren't dead. I knew that. Uh, I found that out later on. But can you imagine preaching to a, a, a congregation of just dead bones? But it says here that his preaching really worked very well. So he said, I prophesied. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, there was a rattling sound, and the bones started coming together. There was movement in the congregation, which is, uh, that's kind of what you really want, isn't it, when you start preaching? And you see, and you see things start to happen. Um, then he said to me, just to note there, I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So a good-looking congregation, but still dead, because there's no breath. He said, prophesy to the breath um, and say to it, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. And then we've already seen that this is... People are saying, we have no hope. We're like dried bones. And then it ends with, therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I've done it, declares the Lord. Three things that happen here, I think. The source of hope is knowing God. You'll see that repeat three times. It's a, then you will know that I am the Lord. It's knowing the character of God. It's understanding his way of running the universe. That, that's, that's the source of hope uh, that the Bible speaks about. The instrument of hope is the word of the Lord. So we need exposure to the Bible. We need exposure to God's word. Yes, we need to prophesy. We need to be preaching. We need to be teaching, helping our people to see, to catch uh, a God-inspired picture of the future because that's the only place where we will get true hope, to see what 
future does God see for this earth? Right now, <laughs> it's very difficult to see past coronavirus, but God has a different picture in mind. And so we need to bring the word to people, to ourselves. If you want your hope to grow, expose yourself to God's word. And the final, the final thing then is that the agent of hope is the spirit of God. The thing that brings real life is to wait for the spirit to do what he does best. As it says in Isaiah 30, I haven't put this on the screen. It's in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. It's in quietness before God and trusting in his spirit and catching a glimpse of that future that he has, that he then can empower us with the agency as, as been pointed out by some of these psychologists to do something about the hope that we have for the future. So may God help us and bless us and inspire us to catch his vision of the future, to catch his hope. Amen.